Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Behind the Seams Podcast. Today, this is kind of part two with Dr. Casey Pierce, orthopedic surgeon specialist in Wayne, New Jersey, and has over 11 years experience in the medical field. Born and raised in Pasadena, California, West Coast guy, where he was a three-sport letterman at San Marino High School. After attending the United States Air Force Academy for one year, he obtained his BA degree from Colgate University. His medical studies included one year at New York Medical College, one year at Stedman Clinic in Vail, Colorado, and he graduated from St. George's University of Medicine in 2011. Dr. Pierce completed his residency in orthopedic surgery at Seton Hall University, St. Joseph University Medical Center, where he served as chief resident. Dr. Pierce also completed a year's study at Dr. James Andrews Renowned Fellowship at the American Sports Medicine Institute, the guys in the baseball community, we otherwise we know this as ASMI in Birmingham, Alabama, and is currently affiliated with Cooper and Barnabas Medical Center and Hackensack Meridian Mountainside Medical Center. So today we'd like to welcome to the show, Dr. Casey Pierce. What's up, Doc? Not much, Nunzio. Thanks for having me. We talked a little bit about Tommy John in the last episode, but I wanted to kind of talk about some of the procedures. Let's talk about the facts for a minute. A recent study in the physician and sports medicine showed that 30% of youth baseball players up to the age of 12 reported episodes of shoulder or elbow pain. Another report in the Journal of Arthroscopy noted 31% of pitchers up to the age of 22 have experienced arm injury as well. And over a third of Tommy John procedures performed are on youth pitchers. TJs are at an all-time high. This was up to 2021. You know, there's a lot of reasons for it, mostly overuse. We're not going to get into the reasons why kids are getting Tommy John. The thing that prompted me on this was I had a, a an actual parent call me up and ask me, do we get PRP injections? And I, you know, I, I generally send them to you. So I called you up and I asked you and I said, you know what? I get a lot of these questions, you know, from parents. So I think many parents and athletes that I speak to are completely unaware, or should I say, not educated enough on the topic to, along with their doctor, make these good decisions as to what are their different options procedure-wise, what's the right option, how it affects the timeline of their recovery. So today I wanted you to talk a bit about, you know, the UCL, its role in the pitching delivery, some detail into the different options and what each entails procedure-wise. And, uh, you know, which situations are suitable to an athlete's individual situation. So let's start. Can you just sure. please give us a short overview of the ulnar collateral ligament and its, and its role in the pitching delivery? So the ulnar collateral ligament is one of the, the main, what we call static stabilizers of the elbow. So static stabilizers, things that hold the elbow in place when it's not in motion. Muscles and other things contribute to what's called dynamic stabilization. You can make as muscles tighten as the elbow moves. They contribute in different ways. But the static stabilizers are the things that give your joints stability. So things like your MCL and your ACL and your knee, same idea with the Tommy John ligament or the UCL and the elbow. Now, the UCL has a couple components. The one we're most concerned about with the overhead throwing athletes, especially baseball players, is the anterior bundle. So when you think about elbow injuries, Baseball players and, and javelin throwers and gymnasts and, and people that repetitively stress their elbow get different injuries um, that kind of go by the same name. So I think it's important that you parse those out. So if you think of like a wrestler or a football player where they get hit real hard in the elbow and say the elbow dislocates or nearly dislocates, they get a tear of the ulnar collateral ligament. But that is vastly different than a tear of the ulnar collateral ligament in a baseball player. Traumatic injuries tend to be full thickness tears with tearing of the entire ligament, where the, the ligament does not require repair. It just requires immobilization and physical therapy, and it tends to heal back down without too much long-term problem. Um, whereas pitchers and overhead athletes, javelin throwers, softball players, what they do is they strip away the ligament over time. So chronic damage over time where it pulls away more and more of the ligament and eventually it becomes symptomatic. Um, and so that's where we talk about partial tears or avulsion tears or things like that. Now, certainly baseball players, especially tear uh, players as they get older and accumulate chronic damage can get full thickness ruptures of ligament. But again, it's usually only part of the ligament, not the full thing like it would be in a traumatic instance. So they get and treated very differently. That and th so, so that's a good point because 
what you're saying is when we when we experience something from trauma, there's not a really whole hell of a lot you can do about that. You know what I mean? From a from a traumatic hit. OK, because I, I also have guys that come into us because we're overhead athletes and they're and a lot of football players tear their labrums by getting hit, you know, and that's a trauma thing. But when what you're saying is these happen over time, it gets worn away, which which tells me that this sends a message out that, you know, pitch counts are just, you know, a necessity. Because this well, 100%. is hundred percent. Yeah. And Nancy, there, there was actually a study. Uh, it's probably gotta be a dozen years ago now where a, a group, I, I think it was out of DuPont Delaware. They looked at um, ultrasound findings of, of UCL ligaments and asymptomatic youth athletes. So softball players and baseball players, they looked at what kind of damage they have compared to a non-throwing population in, in younger years. This was, this was like teenage kids and even kids even lower than that, like little leaguers. And they saw that, Kids that throw overhead, especially pitchers or, or softball players that catch or have a high demand in throwing, start to accumulate thickening and damage of that UCL ligament at a young age. And I think part of that is understanding what goes into a throwing motion and that every time you raise your arm to throw a ball overhand, reach back and then rock it forward, you actually approach the failure strength of that UCL ligament. The stress put on your elbow comes real close to a tipping load every time you do it. Um so I think that's where, you know, understanding how important rest is and not throwing when you're tired or throwing when you're hurt is just, it's critical for every coach, every parent and every player that, that way you, there's no one to blame. If something goes wrong, if you're overthrowing or throwing when you're injured or, or being used too often, it's, you got no one to blame if you're not staying informed. I know. And you know what? I, I tell people all the time. I tell, I have to tell the parents because sometimes the parents are the biggest culprits. I'm like, listen, dude, this is bigger than you. <laughs> you know, you're, you're not going to kind of like find a way to yeah. skate around this. So, okay. We're doing the best we can with pitch counts, educating our guys on, on arm care, you know, and then guys start throwing in the nineties and shit happens. Right. So, exactly. so, exactly. Please provide our listeners. Um, they really the big thing about the, today's podcast was giving them, um, you know, the options that there are available, what that procedure looks like, what what's involved in it, and the and the time frame. So, um, please correct me if I don't have these in the order from lightest to heaviest, and we'll talk about one at a time. So the first one is conservative care slash PT. The second one is PRP yep. injections. The third is surgical repair, repair with an internal brace. And the fourth one is a full Tommy John repair. So um, can you start with the conservative care and wh what do you see and when do you decide that this is the right option and we'll, we'll go one at a time? Sure. So I think any, any injury, whether it's in baseball or any other sport or it's an elbow or a knee or a hip, conservative care is, is usually the first option. Um, so that, that usually entails for a baseball player with a Tommy Dunn injury, whether it's a partial tear or full tear is rest, absolute rest for some period of time. In my practice, typically that time period starts at six weeks, six weeks of doing nothing, maybe some light range of motion therapy, um, maybe some very light strengthening, but nothing that puts stress on the elbow unduly. Um, now that can be a time to restore normal motion, restore normal muscle response, work on your shoulder. If you're having shoulder problems in, the, in, 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 in uh, together with the elbow, but, but usually that period of rest means absolutely no throwing and nothing that stresses the elbow. And that's in, where it's really important, whether you have a trainer or a therapist, someone to guide you there. Because things you wouldn't think about that stress the elbow, a lot of kids still do. Um, and that can be things like squats. When you put your arm up to hold and support a squat bar, if you're doing a front squat or, or a weighted squat, a lot of times the position you hold your arm can actually stress your elbow and stress that UCL ligament. So that's where it's important where you don't just tell a kid, hey, seen six weeks you actually give them some guidance and talk away to protect their elbow and make sure they're doing the right things and we hope in that time that some portion of of ligament injuries will heal and certainly you see a lot of major league players where they get diagnosed with a ucl strain or a ligament strain or a partial tear and they go into a conservative protocol where they rest for you know usually six weeks and they start a throwing program and then oftentimes around three months they give it a shot again to see what happens and i think the the tough part about that is conservative treatments of UCLs are not as successful as we want. Even partial tears in younger athletes that tend to have a higher healing potential, you know, the, the return to play after that is usually 100%, but a lot of them end up with the same problem either weeks later or months later because it didn't fully heal or they re-injure it for some other reason. Conservative care should be the first option. 
when when you're looking at an MRI or you're looking at you're you're testing the the, the, the ligament, um, is this when you see no tear at all and it's mostly a strain, or do you use uh, conservative care? A lot of care? times, yeah, you yeah, yeah. A lot of times, conservative care. If I see like a very small partial tear, or more commonly, if I don't see a tear but they examine like one, you know, MRIs aren't perfect. Even we add dye and do arthrograms, they're not a window into your soul. They can't see everything. They will miss very small tears in the ligament sometimes. But oftentimes you'll have a guy that examines like a UCL, but it could just be a strain of the forearm musculature. You know, the flexor is down in your forearm in the same spot. So can you please explain so, to the listening audience when you say presents like a tear or examines like a tear, what is that? So they can so sure. they can know what that looks like. Yeah. So that's I mean, some of that is history. The, the, the athlete will come and tell you, hey, when I throw, I'm losing velocity or losing control. You know, my elbow hurts kind of at the bony areas on my elbow. Or even occasionally they'll, they'll report they're getting some numbness in their fourth and fifth fingers, almost like hitting your funny bone. That can accompany these injuries. And then exam-wise, it's, it's when I examine in my office. So when I stress their elbow, when I touch the kind of landmarks, the attachment sites of the UCL in their elbow, if they have pain in those areas, that's what I mean by presentation. So okay. it's, it's not always – you're not always going to have the, the good fortune to have an athlete present with an MRI already done or an arthrogram already done to kind of guide you. A lot of times – as a sports care physician, as a, as a surgeon, a lot of my diagnosis comes from my exam, and then I use MRIs to confirm what I think I already know. So conservative care then and PT, you're saying it's about six weeks. Um, is this six weeks before a return to throw? It, yeah, it's six weeks of absolute rest, and then you kind of re-examine and see if the pain's gone. Okay. If the pain's gone, you should have a very conservative throwing program, which is a situation which is usually around three months so you're saying that a three uh after about three months generally if it's a normal situation that's when you'll begin a back to throw and how long of a program how long of a throwing program um are we looking at after three months so usually what i'm saying actually is after six weeks if they're feeling good i'll start the throwing program then and then it's a six week um throwing program to return to, to full oh, okay speed. so i got you so it's six weeks yeah. of rehab and then it's a it's, it's a six week ramp up before they can actually start throwing hard you got it and now to be honest in my practice i don't know that in the last say two or three years i've ever treated someone with a strict conservative program um, right and that may some of that may be parent driven some of that may be athlete driven but usually when people come to my office with a young pitcher or even an older pitcher with a partial ucl injury the first step we're going to talk about in terms of conservative care is a PRP injection and then putting them in a similar protocol um, to, to a normal conservative care uh, protocol. So let's get on to PRP then. That would be the second that would be the second um, paradigm in this. So can you please explain PRP and what that is and what, what, sure. what, what we're dealing with? Yeah, PRP stands for platelet-rich plasma. So the basic idea of what PRP is, is we draw your blood and usually we draw about 60 cc's of blood. So think about, you know, half a Coke can. We draw that and we spin it down and, and by spinning, it separates the blood into special layers. The layer we're looking for is this platelet rich layer. So the platelets are heavier than most cells around them. So they spin down into a nice layer, which you can collect. And there's various devices that can do this to machines, you know, that all involve spinning it and then drawing it out with a needle. And usually when you spin down, you know, that amount of blood, those 60 cc's, you can get anywhere from a couple of cc's to maybe even five or six cc's of this platelet rich layer. And what the platelet rich layer has in it is the platelets where you have growth factors and healing factors and things that we think help tissue heal. Now, there's there's actually two versions of platelet rich plasma and, and how we classify those is based on if they have white blood cells in them or if they don't. So we call those leukocyte rich and leukocyte poor. And they're used for different things nowadays. PRP has been used for everything to treat arthritis, partial ligament tears, tendonitis, like golfer's elbow and tennis elbow, and even things like wrinkle care, trying to reduce wrinkles or regrow hair when you've had hair transplants. So the different uses depend on the quality of the spin and then what's left behind in terms of the white blood cells. And what we, we and we're still kind of touching the surface of this. We don't fully understand it, I'd say, is we think what happens when you inject that into a damaged ligament or damaged tissue, it helps turn your body's healing response on. So somewhere where maybe your body was having trouble healing tissue, like a tendonitis or a partial tear, this augments that and turns the body's natural response on so that they come in and do the job it wasn't doing. And I hear, you know, there's 
I have people that come in and say, oh, PRP, it's only successful 50% of the time, um, this and that. Can you tell me, is there any validity to the um, the efficiency of this of this procedure as far as um, the percentage rate of success? Sure. Yeah. So the there was a study published maybe five or six years now, at least, um, specific for partial UCL tears or return to play in this 70% range. Um, meaning that if you give someone with a partial UCL tear, a PRP injection, and they weren't rechecking like re-MRI to see if it healed, but they could get back and play baseball and pitch at a 70% rate without recurrence, their symptoms. Well, the, the non-op, a conservative care is about 40 or 30%. So it, it does build on that and certainly improve it. Now, I think anecdotally and in my practice, I tend to tell parents, especially because they're the ones that are going to be paying for this, that it's about a 50-50 shot. And that's based on my experience, what I've seen, and then what you see when you watch big leaguers. I mean, you, you'll you see guys in the big league at a high clip getting PRP injections, but if you follow them, a lot of them end up getting a Tommy John surgery within the next year. And, and Shohei Otani, everyone remembers when he hurt his arm and he, he was gone for three months, got a PRP injection, and then came back, finished the year, and then all of a sudden is having Tommy John at the end of the year. Right. So I think you got to be careful buying into it too much. And I, I think sometimes patients think because they're paying for it, because PRP is not covered by insurance, that when they're paying for something, it gives them a better opportunity, a better chance of healing. And that's not the case. But it is a chance to avoid surgery. When you're talking about teenage athletes, that's a hard decision not to make in favor of paying a little bit of money to get a PRP injection if they meet the criteria to have a decent chance of success. Right. So so PRP is kind of like the first step before we actually decide if we're going to use an internal brace, surgically repair with an internal brace. Is that correct? Exactly. So, we, so exactly. we'll give that. So the PRP injections, um, how many injections, how often, what, what's the, what's usually the protocol for that? And how long sure. before, how long before a return to throw program? Sure. So, so, so all my PRP injections, whether it's hip, knee, shoulder, elbow, whatever it is, um, I only use one. Now there's been studies to look at, should you do one, two, three, 15, and no one's, really, as far as I understand, at least been able to prove that more than one is, is more efficacious um, or more effective. So I always think, especially for an elbow, one, throwing a second or third, I don't think it has much benefit for a Tommy John injury. Now, if you're talking about tendonitis or bursitis and they get relief, but it comes back, maybe a second, then or a third, if they really want to. But for a Tommy John injury, typically it's one injection, one trial. You go through a conservative plan. If it doesn't work, we're talking surgery. And typically what a conservative plan looks like is there's, there's kind of two major components. One is rest. You got to give this stuff time to work and time to get the body kick in the right direction. So a lot of times after a PRP injection, I'll put patients in a sling for a week. And I'll tell them, look, the first week, move your elbow a little bit, but really don't use it at all. Um, after that first week, they start a physical therapy protocol where they start working on range of motion. They avoid eccentric contractions for about five weeks. And then they ramp up and usually by the seventh or eighth week, that's when they're ready to start a, throw, a throwing protocol with the idea that that same thing around three months, they're going to pick up a baseball, try and throw it hard, try and throw some simulated innings and see other elbow feels. So when you say uh, three months before they do a, a throwing program, but this throwing program is within itself, probably eight to 12 weeks long, correct? Because we yeah, got to ramp up. And that, that starts about you know six or eight weeks after the injection. So they're really, the throwing starts fairly early, you know, month and a half, two months after the PRP injection, but it starts extremely slow. And it, it's more, you know, you, you start, basically you start at a short distance throwing kind of half speed. You work your way out to a longer distance to increase the effort. And then you bring the distance back down where you're really dropping the ball down and throwing it hard. And it takes time to get through that protocol. So um, athletes get excited when they start throwing, thinking they're about to be on the mound. And then they realize it's six weeks till they really start cranking it up. Right. And what, what, when we talk about starting slow and <clears throat> using distance, um, I just want to make a, I want to make a mention that when we, when we rehab our guys, we don't use distance as a, as a, we start with the distance, but we, we gun them based off of research that we've read. And um, we do feel like 30, 30%, 35%, 40%, that relates to a specific velocity um, as far as RPE goes. And we have a chart. I think I sent you that chart. Yeah, um, yeah. It's a, it's and, an, and, you know, I, I got to tell you, this is something that I, I love talking to you about because I, I think we have a little different feeling. 
and it, that doesn't make me right and you wrong, but I, I take this as one side, I'm a surgeon. Um, so I always want to be gentle on my, my post tops or my post injections, but also I, I was a pitcher for 20 years of my life. You know, I, I, I pitched growing up and I, I pitched in college on not a collegiate level, but a, 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 you know, a club level. And I, I still teach my kids how to pitch and, and younger kids on our baseball teams. And I, I think of it as if you tell a pitcher to throw 70%, well, if that pitcher throws a hundred miles an hour, 70% is not 70 miles an hour. 100%. It's what feels like 70%. And that's where I, I love talking about with you because you're not saying, hey, 70 miles an hour is 70%. You're using kind of evidence and anecdotal stuff to, to decide what mile per hour for each pitcher represents their 70%. Yeah, I, I can tell you a guy that throws 100 miles an hour, I believe 70% is somewhere in the vicinity of like 65 miles an hour, 50 miles yeah, an hour, maybe. Absolutely. At, at seven, yeah. you know what I mean? So, so um, it's great. I just wanted to clarify that because I know that you're on your when I get even the, you know, the greatest, you guys are all unbelievable. You and Dr. Ahmad and Dr. Alchek, that you guys all send your guys here to strength train. When I get these throwing programs back sometimes and I look, there is, there is no talking about rate of perceived exertion. Cause I'll tell you, I, I rehab these kids. And when you tell a 16 year old kid to throw at 45% after seven throws, he's at 55%. They have oh, one, yeah, they have one speed, a hundred. That's like, that's hundred yep. percent. And you know, so I feel that it keeps it in good. So that's, a, that's really great. So PRP good for partial tears um, in a sling one week, Six, seven weeks of PT starting then then onto a back to throw program. If that does not work and we're back to the drawing board, um, what are we looking at? Surgical repair with an internal brace. What is an internal brace? Sure. Let, let me just give you one more point about PRP. So one other thing that's super important with PRP is understanding how it works on a cellular level. So what's important is athletes and the parents need to understand for the first six weeks at least after a PRP injection. You cannot take any kind of anti-inflammatory. That means no Motrin, no Aleve, no right. ibuprofen, no aspirin. That's you can take great. Tylenol. You can you can you can use ice, but want ice in a limited fashion because ice is a natural anti-inflammatory. And that's something that a lot of parents don't understand. You know, they're giving their kid Motrin because they're sore from the injection, and that Motrin on a cellular level actually turns off platelets. So it's exactly what we don't want. Um, so that's it's, it's great. important for parents to understand that even if they don't read it from their surgeon. Right. On to uh, surgical repair with an internal brace. So, an in sure. So, what an internal brace is is back in the in the early days of Tommy John injury. So, before Tommy John became the Tommy John surgery, you know, when guys would have UCL tears and we'd see them on exam or see them on MRIs, they tried repairing them, and, and patients did terrible. They tried stitching ligament back to the bone in ways we do with other ligaments that's successful. But the, the UCL was not a ligament that tolerated that well at all. And and I think it was a failure rate somewhere in like 70 or 80 percent of guys never made it back after a surgery like that. Um, so then we moved forward to this Tommy John procedure where you're rebuilding the ligament and, and using either cadaveric tissue from a dead person or your own tendons or, or ligaments to rebuild it. And that was highly successful. But then the next iteration was, well, let's go back and try and fix our old mistake and figure out a way we can repair it to avoid uh, you know, the, the ligament reconstruction with cadaver tissue or harvesting your own tissue and try and speed return to play. And so that idea is where the, the internal brace came in. So an internal brace, what you do, um, you know, from a, a standpoint of, of the actual procedure is you open the ligament like you would for a Tommy John, but with a partial tear, you put an anchor, which is almost, if, if you look at it in real life, what it looks like it's almost like a drywall screw. And you put the anchor where the tear is. So, and so Tommy John injuries can be lower than what we call that distal or proximal, that kind of bony prominence here. We call that the medial epicondyle. So you have to know where the tear is. You put the first anchor there, you open the ligament, and you stitch back down the, tear, the, the ligament to the bone. You use this anchor. You close the ligament and you put what we call an internal brace over it. And what an internal brace is, it's a thickened piece of, t of, um, of tape almost like a thick suture and it's collagen impregnated or dipped in collagen to help donate good tissue to the healing ligament below you put that over the repair and then use a second anchor at either the 
the proximal or distal, meaning the further down or lower down portion of the tear, and then you tighten it. And that's where the real art of medicine comes in and learning to do these by doing them with someone who really knows how to teach. And for me, that was just tight is too tight and how loose is too loose because you want this, this collagen brace, this internal brace to act like a check rein. So the elbow can't re-stress and damage the ligament again. And you also don't want it too tight that you can't bend your elbow. If you over tighten it, the elbow won't flex all the way or extend all the way. And you've really made a bad situation worse. Yeah. And so the idea being that once you have that brace in, it holds the elbow in a right position. It donates good healing tissue to the ligament below, allows the ligament to heal strong again, and then protects it in the future. And so the thinking with that is one, it's a procedure that doesn't require as much damage being done to the body, but two, it may be, allow athletes to return to sport faster. And, and that's to me, the biggest advantage of this. It has borne out a much faster return to play. When you say a faster return to play, a faster return to play than full Tommy John. Exactly. exactly. And what is so we, so, we quote good. We, we, we quote Tommy John injuries, you know, the, the kind of standard of care is look, it's going to take a year to get back. And, and that's a year to get back throwing competitively. But if you look at pitching data and how pitchers recover on a college or major league level, they come back at a year, but their ERA doesn't go back down. Their whip doesn't go back down. Their walk to strikeout ratio doesn't go back where it was or start improving for usually about 18 months. Um, whereas with a, a the internal brace, That's when the throwing program starts. With you, an you internal just, brace, I'm sorry. the throwing program starts at three months or four months. Okay, could you repeat that one more time? You cut right. out right there with an internal brace. Sure. Yeah, the, so the Tommy John surgery, a throwing program usually starts around six months. And that's because we have to wait for the ligament to reincorporate and go through what's called ligamentization. With an internal brace, you're healing and protecting. So we stress that faster. And we start a throwing program around three or four months. And the typical recovery for an internal brace is back on the field throwing somewhere between six and eight months. Um, so it's a much faster return. You're talking at least four months faster. That's great. And that, that what, what, when do you look for, um, so you can use this surgical repair with an internal brace and there is no, no, uh, is there a grade tear where you realize that, you now need to go to surgical repair and bypass PRP altogether? Or where does this fall in between PRP and Tommy John where you're thinking that you can use an internal brace? What are you looking at to make to, to, to make that decision? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, there, so when we grade ligament tears, we grade them one to three. One is essentially a stretch of the ligament, so no tear. Two is a partial tear, and three is a complete tear. So grades don't really affect it. Usually for, for repairs, you're talking about a grade two injury, a partial tear. Um, a grade one injury would be conservative all day long. Um, you know, for partial tears and, 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 and internal bracing, I think they meet the same criteria as far as should you do an internal brace or should you do a, uh, a PRP injection. I think more of that depends on patient's preference and timelines for return. If you've got a kid that, hey, I want to try and pitch this year if I can get back, PRP injection because Tommy John's going to take him out for the year. You've got a kid that's at the end of one year and he's got college recruiters coming next year. And your decision is versus is Tommy John full Tommy John versus internal brace. Well, then it's internal brace. That's the only chance they have to show up and show off for that coming year. So I think a lot of your decision-making is a full damaged ligament injury typically needs a Tommy John, but any of the partials, a lot of it is time frame and what they're working with. So if you have the, the time thing frame though is it, if you have the if you have enough time frame, it's better to go with the internal brace. Well, better than it, it depends on the injury. Obviously, we think I think internal brace is better because I do so many of them. But you'll have a lot of guys arguing that you know internal brace has limited criteria and that maybe we're doing too many of them. Um, and I think that's where when I tell parents, hey, I'm I'm going to do an internal brace for your your son or daughter. Every patient I consent for surgery for that. On their consent, it has to give me the permission that if I see significant damage to the, the ligament, whether that's pieces of bone in it or calcifications or that it just looks worse than it did on the MRI, I have to have their permission to do a full Tommy John reconstruction. And so they understand going to surgery, man, I'm 95% sure I'm doing a brace and our timeline looks like six to eight months, but there is a chance you'll come out with a full Tommy John and we're talking year, year and a half. Um, and, and, you're, and you're really looking based on what you see. 
So that's that's what I'm going to go one more time based off of what you see. What are the things? Okay, you open it up. You're planning on putting in a brace, and now you see X, and now you have to do a full Tommy John. So what are what are some of the things that you look for that like you're oh shit we got to do a full. Yeah. So the, the biggest thing is the quality of the, of the ligament. If it's just shredded and beat up, and when I put it back down on the bone, it just looks like it's hanging on by a thread. You got to you got to change gears right there and do a full Tommy John because they'll fail. The, the other thing we commonly see is you can see little calcifications or little pieces of bone within the ligament. And if when you take those out, the remaining tissue isn't that good quality or, or strong. Those are the ones, the same thing, you got to pull the trigger. That, I think a lot of that is, is, you know, I'm blessed that I had the experience of being down in Birmingham and, and seeing Dr. Dugas make that decision live on a table so that I know what it looks like when you shouldn't do it. I think people that learn to do a Tommy John or an internal brace procedure and they haven't had to make that decision it's still fairly obvious in the OR. If you've seen a couple of Tommy John ligaments and you, you've you seen that UCL and you've seen the quality of the normal tissue, what a repair looks like, you'll know when you're looking at a bad one. And it'll be easy for you to say, yeah, this is one that's got to get a full Tommy John. That's great. So we're, we're, we're at full Tommy John repair right now, which is what a lot of, a lot of the guys that come in back and rehab with me, um, you know, they go in for a full Tommy John. Uh, and I just want to bring up a point of strength training, even with full Tommy John repairs. Um, I tell guys, listen, um, you need to you need to come in and you need to continue to strength train. You need to continue to get strong. I tell them to wait two to three weeks before there's any, um, you know, before there's any problem if they're taking pain meds or if they're, you know, any danger of, of falling. And I tell them to wait two to three weeks. And then we come in and we work on the entire body, um, except for that arm. Um, guys will come in with slings. Sure. And um, I just want your opinion, because um, I know there's a lot of old school doctors that would say, no, wait, like I have guys sometimes that come in and I said, when did you get Tommy John? And they're like, five months ago. And I'm like, five months ago? Why are you starting <laughs> to train now? Why are you starting strength training now? Yeah. You've already started throwing and you haven't lifted a weight yet. Like why, if you can throw? So they tell me, my doctor told me no weight lifting yet. And I, I think that, you know, there is some, there's some credit to that because there are a lot of meathead strength and conditioning coaches that will put too much weight in a guy's hand or make him use that arm. I mean, we don't even in the first month of treatment, we don't even do anything where they could lose their balance and even fall. So it's like, you know, I, I think that, and correct me if I'm wrong, getting somebody into a strength training program, not only keeps them strong, it makes them feel athletic. It keeps them from feeling like a hospital patient and it keeps them in the game and lets them, you know, lets them feel like there's progress being made. Man, I couldn't agree more with that. You know, I, 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 I have this kind of speech I give athletes where it's, look, you got two weeks of just relaxing to let your tissue heal and the inflammation calm down, and then it's time to become an athlete again. And that could be, you know, if that's a 16-year-old kid that plays basketball that tore his ACL, well, he can go shoot free throws in two weeks. If he can stand up straight or he can sit in a chair, he can shoot free throws, he can become a better basketball player. Same thing with a baseball player. Just because your elbow doesn't work doesn't mean you can't strengthen your core, your legs. You know, exactly. And become a better baseball player. Work on your balance, which is, I mean, teaching kids to pitch, trying to get kids to understand you have to be balanced to throw a baseball. It's the utmost importance. And being a better athlete starts with strength and conditioning and training in the way you're talking about. And, and that's having someone like you who's intellectual and smart about this and protects the elbow. I mean, just saying something like you want to make sure they don't fall. That's why I think you're good at this. And I think athletes appreciate that. And I think it's really important. I try to tell them, I try to tell the parents, listen, are we going to wait five months for this kid to be start throwing? And now he has to get in the weight room. He's gained eight pounds. He feels terrible about himself, right? And now we're trying sure. to get the arm in shape, but now we have to get the whole body in shape. And what I've found is the guys that come back from t rehabbing with us, when they start throwing, by the time they get to 60 or 70%, they're staring at me and they're going like, Wow. I'm throwing it like 60% and I feel like I'm hardly throwing at all. And you know what? It's because they've never spent more time on their body than because they couldn't throw. So now they're they're stronger. And now we don't have to get the whole body in shape. Now we're just worried about strengthening that arm in the weight room when once weight training can begin again. So I think it's it's really, really 
uh, an important factor. So sorry, I, I got off. I got off the full Tommy John repair, but the um, just the the return, the rehab a process of Tommy John. Go ahead. Sure. So uh, Tommy John is different than the internal brace. Internal brace, you're waiting for the ligament to heal with that protection over it. For a Tommy John reconstruction or any ligament reconstruction, ACLs, things like that, what you're waiting for is you're waiting for that grafted tissue to turn into normal tissue or normal-ish tissue. It will never be the same. It's going to be different. So the grafted tissue undergoes this process known as ligamentization. And basically what that means is your body treats the grafted tissue like a scaffold to bring in new cells, new vascularity, new blood vessels, and eventually convert it into some version of a similar ligament to what you had before. And that takes time. Most of the studies we have for understanding ligamentization come through ACL studies. And what we see is when the graft is put in, that's the strongest it is. Time zero of surgery, the graft is stronger than native ligament, and then it undergoes degradation for the next three to six weeks. And in that time, the strength of the graft can drop to as low as about 11% of what was put in. Wow. So that's where you have, that's why we have braces and we protect it and we're careful. And then it starts to revascularize new blood, uh, new blood flow, new cells. And, and that process is variable. It takes somewhere around six months, maybe as long as nine. Um, and that's when the graft starts reaching its maturity and strength. And it continues for years. It, it undergoes cellular maturation and changes for years after the actual surgery. But that's why we protect these things and do the rehab protocols the way we do is we know the strength of the tissue isn't ready at certain times. So we try and balance that with what we think is the right way to do it without actually taking a biopsy and seeing how strong your, your tissue is at, at different times. That's great. This has been this has been really, really um, eye opening for me as far as what I can actually enlighten some parents on before they actually come to see you. Um, so just really in just summarizing the four, the four initial, I mean, there's always going to be, you know, in betweens, but the four, the four initial things that we're looking at are conservative care with PT um, is, is for like a grade one or a, or a stretched out ligament. After that, we have PRP mm -hmm. injections. Um, it's, it's generally, uh, that's generally where you like to start. Um, if, if they, if, if, if we see that it's not working, um, we'll go to surgical repair with an internal brace. If we see a grade two tear, um, we'll try that. And grade three is a full Tommy John repair. Um, each one having a little bit longer of a, of a back to throw where you, you're looking at, like, maybe you said, I think six to nine months for a brace where you're looking at 12 to 18 months for a full Tommy John repair. Is that exactly. looking right? Man, I got so smart today. Right. Thank you. I thank you, brother. So, uh, so Dr. Pierce, how can people reach you uh, if if they if they have questions or they they they're looking to uh, find more out about it? Yeah, so my, my practice is is mostly out of Wayne, but I also see patients in Clifton, and I got partners that are all over the place that also kind of do similar procedures, Morristown, um, you know, West Orange. Uh, easiest way is go online. Academy Orthopedics is our practice. Academy Ortho is the website. Um, and then our phone number, 973-446-7500. Uh, that's probably the easiest way. But I'm also on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I'm relatively easy to find. So uh, if you ever got questions, I'm, I'm happy to talk or answer or shoot me an email or, or find me online. I will say that every time I have a question um, or I recommend somebody to Dr. Pierce, I'm oh, I he he responds right back to me, which is really, really refreshing. And um, his 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 when the, when the patients come back when the athletes come back they always tell me how great how great the process has been so kudos to that um, for you you can reach me at at Nunzio Signore on Twitter you can reach my facility RPP Baseball at RPP underscore Baseball at Twitter and on Instagram and our website is www.rocklandpeakperformance.com. Um, if you haven't looked into it yet and you're a strength and conditioning coach, I have a book out on velocity-based training, how to apply science, technology, and data to maximize performance. It's released by Human Kinetics, and you can get it on Amazon as well. Um, we've been talking to Dr. Casey Pierce. Uh, and, Doc, thanks for being on the show. Hey, Nunzio, it's always my pleasure, man. It's a great time. Great. And uh, stay tuned uh, for next week on Behind the Seams podcast. Have a great day.